I was a star actor on the show Family Feud, but I was hiding a disturbing secret. My name is Timothy Bleefnik, and this is my story. In 2020, I was a star on the popular game show Family Feud. Steve Harvey asked me the question, what do I regret the most about my wedding? And I responded and said that my biggest regret was saying I do. I played it off like a joke, but deep down I was hiding some very disturbing secrets. I had been married to my wife for 12 years, but shortly after the game show I filed for divorce. I didn't know it at the time, but she had told her friends that she was worried I was going to snap and in anger I would harm her. She was right. In early 2023, I snuck into my ex-wife home through the second story window, walked up to her and shot her 14 times. I was arrested and charged two weeks later. I pled not guilty, but during the trial over 200 pieces of evidence were used to show that I had done the murder. I was found guilty by the jury and I was sentenced to three life sentences that would all be served together under the same life sentence. I will be spending the rest of my days in jail watching Family Feud. Follow for more stories. This is a moment a jealous man led his estranged wife to her brutal death. <coughs> Paweł Szmielewski later killed his wife, Marta, stabbing her more than 30 times. Following the murder, he stayed with her body in his rented room in Northamptonshire for four days, only leaving to buy beers from a local shop. So why did he kill her? Police say Smielski had failed to accept his marriage was over after Marta had started dating a work colleague. He'd kept contacting her despite her keeping her distance and telling him it was over. Police were alerted to the danger after a family member got an unusual text from Marta. They said it didn't sound like her. She went round to Schmielewski's flat but got no answer, so she called 999. Officers knocked on the door of the rented room to find 40-year-old Schmielewski with a knife protruding out of his neck, laying next to his dead wife on the floor. He was sent to hospital for treatment and later arrested for the murder. Smielski initially refused to comment before confessing in court. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. I was messaged yesterday and asked to share the story of the lady here. Her name is Ashley King. She is a Mississippian who was living and teaching in South Korea with her South African husband, Craig Wainwright. Don't actually know if a crime took place here. But it is a really strange story. In Craig's Facebook post from December the 24th, you see that he says that his wife had been in the hospital for six weeks. And my sources say that Ashley had been very ill and she was hospitalized for quite a bit of time. And while she was hospitalized, she actually had to be put on the ventilator. After Ashley was discharged, she flew back home to Mississippi to stay with her mom while she recovered. And then once she recovered well enough, she returned back to South Korea with her husband, Craig. On July the 6th, Ashley made this post stating that she had run into a door that had been in the same spot since they had moved into their residence in South Korea. And then on August the 20th, she's involved in a car accident. She has a giant hematoma on her arm, bruises in random places, a cut on her face and neck from the airbag, and whiplash. She says she was ran off the road and the person that ran her off the road fled the scene. And then just two days ago on Thursday, Craig makes this post to Facebook and says that Ashley has passed away, that while he was not there, he thinks that she fell out of a second story window while she was leaning out of the window cleaning a bath rug. Ashley's family is trying to figure out how to get her body back to Mississippi. Meanwhile, Craig is in South Korea trying to have Ashley's remains cremated. This is where it gets really cringy because Craig has taken to YouTube and he's posting videos, um, updates on the situation, but mainly it's updates on Craig. For time's sake, I am going to edit the YouTube videos. Currently, there are two YouTube videos. I will put a link that takes you to these videos. Hey everyone, I figured it would be easier for me to put a video together uh, and just give you all an update as to what's happening here and to tell you how things are and maybe how I'm doing. Maybe you could see how I'm doing. I'm obviously not okay. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it all together to get 
Ashley's body back to the United States was the first problem. At the moment, uh, cremation looks like the best way to go forward. It will be cheaper and more, uh, more flexible for me. I'll be able to bring her remains back at my own leisure. The uh, issue is, is that her mom uh, would like to have her body brought back to the United States. And, and I want to honor her wishes as much as I can on the moment she's okay with cremation, but the next she would like her body back. The, the problem I have with, with that is mostly with the cost. That is about a little over four months salary for me here. It's about maybe $9,000 US. I don't know if, if Ash would be okay with burial. Um, I'm pretty sure she would prefer to be cremated and have her ashes scattered uh, from 35,000 feet as I jump out of a building with a parachute strapped to my back. And that's the big issue right now. We had no friends here in Seoul, or very, very few. I have a great colleague, Ellie, at, at work. She's been been just such a soldier for me there, at least handling that stuff and taking care of admin there. And it's been getting just an absolute avalanche of, of wishes and uh, thoughts and prayers. And I feed on that. I need that. In terms of uh, the police investigation, uh, yesterday I... I had to go to the police station and give my statement, which took about four hours. After that, the one uh, investigator, the, the one detective, he decided to come with me back to the apartment to have a look for himself. But basically the gist is that um, how Ashley died was uh, she might have been cleaning up the apartment a little bit or something. She took our bath mat and she was flapping it outside the window and she might have dropped it or released it. She tried to reach out and get it and uh, she fell out. The reason why I was not here to stop her or to do it myself or anything like that was because I was staying at a hotel at the time. The reason why I was staying at a hotel was because uh, Ash and I were going through a pretty rough time. She was pretty sick and as much as I wanted to help her and I had been helping her, the medication she was taking was causing her to uh, stumble around the apartment. She couldn't stand, she couldn't walk and I would have to nurse her and carry her to and from the bathroom. Well help her get to and from the bathroom and she would also you know not know where she is or what was going on it got very bad and very stressful and i was losing sleep and i was getting stressed and i was starting to have physical symptoms of stress i was i still am now i'm getting them back again i'm feeling aches and pains in my body i'm not okay so i i went to a hotel to get a solid night's rest i i just needed a night that was undisturbed so you know that police in Osage County had been searching the former home of BTK? Well, they discovered a hiding hole in his former home. And a woman depicted in a drawing by him has been possibly identified in more. He was a, uh, a very uh, full of life, typical teenager. This is Cynthia Don Kenny, a 16-year-old cheerleader who vanished from an Oklahoma laundromat in 1976. The self-proclaimed BTK serial killer is now the prime suspect in her case and several other unsolved homicides spanning three states. It was parts of this journal belonging to BTK, real name Dennis Rader, shared exclusively with CNN that prompted law enforcement in Oklahoma to act. Shortly after Kenny's disappearance, the sheriff's office received an anonymous call. That male caller informed them that she was located in an old barn. No evidence that lead was ever looked into. Her body was never found. But authorities are now looking at this journal entry by Raider. Bad wash day. He marked that in 1976, he had murdered someone from a laundry mat. For the first time, law enforcement is revealing detailed drawings made by Raider, showing young girls tied and bound in barns. Our hope was to get these drawings out in hopes that someone will recognize these barns. As investigators comb through Raider's old files for clues that could link him to Kinney's murder and several others, an unexpected volunteer stepped forward. His daughter, Carrie Rawson. If he's innocent on these, I will defend him. If he is guilty, I will nail him to the wall. 
Working with authorities, Rawson visited her father in prison for the first time in 18 years. He's in a wheelchair. He has no teeth left. And he, he went from this, like, vivacious man that was hiking with me right before he was arrested to, like, an elderly man. Did he confess to you? No, he did not. Raider has been in prison since 2005. After pleading guilty to 10 counts of murder, he has not confessed to any additional crimes. But just last week, authorities heard this during one of his prison calls. He said there might still be some things in some old barns. This new investigation led authorities to dig up the area around Raider's former family home just last week in Kansas. The result? More potential evidence discovered. A well-constructed hiding hole. What did you find in the hole that you can tell us? Personal type items. You know, we found uh, items that could have been used for binding people. We found some, some different uh, remains from materials, you know, carpet fibers. John, I was also told that in that hole they found what are called trophies. Items that definitely belong, they say, to females. Now, the next step is that all of these items need to be forensically tested. They need to see if there's any relevancy to these brand new items just discovered to these unsolved cases. This hole was just found last week, John, because of Osage County, Oklahoma. And now Osage is saying that all of these unsolved homicides that they're looking at, they know what the girls were last seen with, last wearing. They have seen Polaroids that Raider made that are part of that journal that have him even wearing some items from his victims. They believe there are some matches of these unsolved victims to items. They want the FBI, they want the Kansas Bureau of Investigation to see if they have those items. So forensics. It's quite possible that his number is a lot higher than what was previously estimated. And he also was only found guilty of 10. And a lot of people are asking, you know, he was so descriptive and forthcoming with these 10 victims when he was arrested. Why would he keep all of this a secret? Well, my hunch is that if this is a hiding hole that held trophies, why would he want to relinquish his trophies? Even if he was never going to be around them ever again, the fact that they existed and he and he only knew where they were and that they were safe for him is a trophy in itself. I have a feeling we're gonna hear a lot more soon. Herpalaki, found dead in Liverpool. This report is from today. Tall bodybuilder, Herpalaki, dead in his flat in Liverpool. Herpalaki, a British convicted criminal, has sadly passed away following a tragic incident. Tall bodybuilder Akinwil Rabiki locally in Northwest England as Herpalaki was found dead in his home in Liverpool. The circumstances surrounding the cause of Purpalaki's death have not been made known to the public at the time of this publication. Purpalaki, a British individual with a criminal record, gained notoriety in Northwest England under the nickname Purpalaki. He stands at an imposing height of 6 feet 5 inches 1, 96 meters and weighs 20 to stones 310 pounds or 140 kilograms. Reports suggest that Arabiki became known for initiating conversations about weight training with younger males, subsequently touching and measuring their muscles, and even inviting them to perform squats with his body weight. Initially, Arabiki's criminal activities were deemed to have a sexual motive, leading to the issuance of a sexual offenses prevention order by Liverpool Magistrates Court in 2006. However, this order was lifted in May 2016, and it's important to note that Arabiki has never been convicted of a sexual offense. On September 12, 2016, BBC3 released an online documentary titled The Man Who Squeezes Muscles, Searching for Purpalaki, which delved into Arabiki's life and reputation. Later that year, he lodged a complaint with Merseyside Police, accusing the BBC of incitement to racial hatred and alleging that the documentary was racist and had unfairly portrayed him. She was always the star of her own TikTok videos, but if she didn't know it already, today Mahek Bakari was told she was self-obsessed by a judge. Often seen alongside her mother, Ansri, their videos were viewed millions of times. But tonight, they are both beginning life sentences for murdering 21-year-old friends Saqib Hussein 
and Hashim Ijazuddin. Outside court, Hashim's brother described it as a bittersweet day. The fact that they're locked behind bars is clearly a relief. However, there's no real justice because my beloved baby brother will never come back. I'm still going to walk past my baby brother's room every single day, morning and night, and I won't be able to annoy him no more. And all because 46-year-old Ansreen Bakari had been having an affair with Saqib Hussein. When it ended, he threatened to tell her husband and share explicit photos. So the Bukharis lured him to this Tesco car park. When he arrived with his friend Hashim in the silver Skoda, they saw not one car but two. As they panicked and sped off, they were followed and chased at high speed up this dual carriageway until they came off the road. Both men died instantly, and when their car was found, it had broken in two. It's come zooming down. Later in custody, Mahek Bukhari tried to claim she had been the victim of road rage. We have seen continued lies and deceit from the defendants as they tried to evade responsibility for the killings. They showed complete disdain for the lives of their victims. The Bakaris were sentenced along with five others, who will serve between 11 and 31 years for their part in the killing of two young men. Again tonight with breaking news. A 15 year old Valley teenager and cheerleader found shot and killed this morning in West Phoenix. Our Ford Hatchet joining us in studio. Ford, you've been checking in with loved ones and close friends this evening. Hey, good evening, Christine. We're still waiting on answers from police tonight, but friends are remembering 15 year old Gia Brown. They say she was a cheerleader at West Point High School, a bright spirit, and also the victim of a Sunday morning shooting. She was very beautiful. Her smile, like she, right when she walked in the room, she just brought everyone joy. Phoenix police say they responded to 109th Avenue and Taft Street after an 8 a.m. call of a person shot. Neighbors say they heard shots even earlier. It was probably about 12.30 or so, and we heard like, five or six shots and they were rapid. Police setting up investigations both in front of the house and behind it on Highland Avenue. We didn't know if it was fireworks or gunshots and uh, and we didn't see anything so we went to bed and then this morning we wake up and there's you know crime scene tape in front of our house and and further down the street. Police say they found the teenage girl with a gunshot wound. She was pronounced dead on the scene. Police haven't confirmed the girl's identity, but friends tell ABC 15 it was Gia, dead at just 15 years old. A very bright person. Like, she was always, like, so genuine and caring and loving. And her hugs were amazing. Phoenix police say no one has been arrested yet. Friends are hoping for justice for Gia, someone they call the most caring person they know. What are you going to miss most about Gia? Having her around. And we're continuing to press Phoenix police for answers tonight. And once we have them, we'll bring them to you both on air and online. But tonight, friends mourning the person they say has a very infectious smile. Christine. They took a life that this world is gonna miss. A family in pieces. She is 15 years old and went to bed in her house, which should be a safe spot in her bed. Trying to describe the agonizing pain of losing a child to gun violence. At 15, had her whole life ahead of her. 
So her family, our family, is hurting. Her cousin, Adrian Smith, was sleeping in the bedroom next door, but didn't wake up. And there was bullet holes in my room too, but I don't know for, for why, but the bullets that hit me, they didn't even break my skin. And uh, I don't know, I guess G is, my, I guess you. G is my angel, but it wasn't supposed to be like that. Sunday morning, police were called to the family home near 107th Avenue and Camelback. We believe it, at least now she was shot and potentially deceased for a long period of time in her bed. Um, it didn't get found until early that next morning by family. I'm the one who had to come back and clean and clean it up in her bed. Detectives believe the shooting most likely happened between midnight and three in the morning. It was the only house that was struck by gunfire, which tends to lead investigators to believe that this wasn't necessarily a random act. This appeared to be um, a targeted incident. If it wasn't already hard enough, Brown is the second unexpected death the family is dealing with. As we were planning one funeral for my mother, we are now we are now wondering what to do. Brown was a sophomore at West Point High School and a member of the Dragon Spirit Line. But her family says she was so much more than that. Gia was a great person. She was a really innocent soul. She didn't do anything to deserve what happened to her. And West Point High School will be uh, getting counseling and emotional support for students and staff who are affected by this loss. Now, Phoenix police and the family are both asking anyone with information that could lead to a suspect in this case, call Silent Witness. You can call that number at 480-WITNESS. Reporting live here in Phoenix, Alexis Dominguez for Arizona's Family. I believe Eric parked somewhere here and Dylan parked on the opposite side of the building. And... Let's walk this way. <clears throat> you can see inside. Oh yeah. Nice. Library was right up here. It tore it down though. <clears throat> now they went up these stairs, but they rebuilt all of this. All of this shit was not here when it happened, but there was still a set of stairs that came up here. Came up here, shot um, Rachel Scott and that other guy, Richard Casaldo, I think his name is. I think they're sitting over here somewhere. Nope. So yeah, so I think they did, they did that shit by the cafeteria, came up here, and entered the school through this way, and then went to the library from the second floor. I think, I don't know. This is new. This wasn't here. This is a new library. <clears throat> Beautiful view. Oh, cool.